This car should need no introduction. It would have been all over your social media over the past few months. This is the all new Proton S70 sedan. It is cheaper than the X50 SUV and it's priced directly against ultra popular B-segment Japanese sedans like the Toyota Vios and the Honda City. As usual with our Proton reviews, this is going to be a long one, but it will be the most detailed, the most comprehensive review you'll find on the internet. I'll tell you everything that's good on the car as well as everything that is bad on it. Of course, I'll also compare it against the X50 SUV, the Toyota Vios, the Honda City, and even the Honda Civic. If you're looking to buy the S70 or even any of its close rivals, you'll want to watch until the very end. Let's go. First, let's clear this whole confusion whether this is a B segment or a C segment sedan. In terms of size, the S70 now is over 200 millimeters longer than the Proton Persona. That is a massive difference right there. But compared to more modern B segment sedans, both its length and wheelbase is only between 20 and 30 millimeters longer than a current Honda City. That's practically negligible. Its wheelbase, in fact, is more than a full 100 millimeters shorter than the C-segment Honda Civic. So clearly, in terms of platform, this is a B-segment product, not a C-segment. And speaking of that, this actually shares the exact same platform as the X50, which Proton calls a B-segment SUV. So clearly, Proton calling this a C-segment sedan is not much more than a marketing ploy. It's the same with the rear suspension as well. While most C-segment sedans have the more sophisticated multi-link rear suspension, this has the simpler, cheaper torsion beams like in a typical B-segment sedan. Right now, I guess Proton doesn't really have a choice on what to call this. They've already called the Proton Persona a B-segment sedan, and this car being much bigger, much more expensive, it has to be seen as the next level up, which is C-segment. But at the same time, this car certainly has quite a few attributes that would make it qualify as a C-segment sedan, such as its turbo engine, its high-quality interior, and its fantastic ride and handling package. Of course, I'll talk about all those in detail later on in this video. If you ask me, it doesn't really matter whether it's a B or a C segment. The most accurate measure of a car is always going to be its price. If you have a budget of between 70 and 90 thousand ringgit and you're looking for a new sedan, your options are the Toyota Vios, the Honda City, and now this Proton S70. Prices are always going to be a better measure than random segments. So whether this is a B or a C is completely irrelevant to me. And that brings us to the prices. There are four variants of the Proton S70 available right now, starting with the base executive for 74,000 ringgit, the premium for 80,000, the flagship for 90,000, and this top spec flagship X that you see here for 95,000 ringgit. Choosing between the variants is pretty simple. The base car at 74,000 ringgit is just a little bit too low spec, a bit too kosong for a car of this size and price. The cloth seats, the plain plastic steering wheel, the small screen, no reverse camera, that just cannot cut it at this level. And even the 80,000 ringgit premium is missing out on any form of ADAS or active safety systems, which to me is completely unacceptable. Why is it that most other brands like Toyota, Honda, and even Perodua can offer all these features on cars that are cheaper than the S70, but Proton can't? I just do not understand that. Now, Proton, I think this has to change very, very soon because AEB should be considered the absolute bare minimum of safety standards to adopt across all car models and not just the top spec versions. Safety should be standard and never optional, especially if you're looking for a new car in 2024. 
So as far as I'm concerned, the S70 only has two variants, the flagship for 90,000 and the flagship X for 95,000. You can just about ignore the bottom two right now. As for the two flagship models, choosing between the two is pretty simple as well because there are just very few differences between the two. The X over here is 5,000 ringgit more and it brings in a sunroof on top, a dash cam inside and this full five-piece body kit. Whether you like a sunroof or not is of course up to your own personal preference but over here is just a small one in front and not a full glass sunroof. And the body kit, while I think it does look pretty good, at least it's not ugly, I've always preferred the simpler standard look of any car instead of tacking on all these aftermarket looking body kits. So for me, I would much rather save the 5,000 ringgit and get the standard flagship instead of the X over here. Do you agree with me on this? Do comment below. So a price range of between 90 to 95,000 ringgit puts it exactly against its two closest rivals, the Toyota Vios and the Honda City. Now, arguably you do get more car with the S70, therefore better value, but again, more on that later on. Against Proton's own X50 SUV, this is now up to 20, 25,000 ringgit cheaper to buy to begin with. And again, I'm only considering the X50 flagship because that's the only one with any form of ADAS. Funnily enough though, Proton actually aims to sell more of this S70 sedan over the X50 SUV. That to me is a bit of a weird take, especially considering Malaysians in general are favouring SUVs over sedans that are seen a little bit old school now. The initial response from the public for the S70 seemed to agree with me as well, with just 8,000 units booked over the first two months, compared to the 20, 30,000 bookings the X50 had when it first launched. So we'll see which one of the two sells more. In any case, Proton isn't exactly targeting X50 buyers with this car, it's targeting the Vios and City customers. So now let's talk about styling and the S70 is clearly a very handsome looking sedan overall. This is based on the Geely M Grand with the only thing that's changed for the Proton being the front grille over here. This is far from being a complete styling change that Proton Design has promised us for about seven years now, but I think the grille itself does look good. It has plenty of horizontal elements to make the whole car look wider, sportier with more road presence as well. And if you are to park this car side by side with the original Gili design, this is clearly the much better looking of the two. Having said that, I still think the X50 SUV looks far more stylish, far more modern compared to this rather old school plain look. And mind you, the X50 is now coming up to four years old, while well, this is brand new to Malaysia. As for the headlights, you do get LEDs across all variants, no halogens here thankfully. And in fact, these are projector LEDs which makes it an upgrade over the flagship X90s which get reflectors across the board. As with all Geely based protons, you also get full LED DRLs which double up as your turn signal indicators which do look good. One thing you will not find on this S70 are front fog lamps. They are not on the Geely M Grand and they are not here either. As for the wheels, the flagship versions get these nice 17 inch dual tone alloys that are wrapped in Goodyear Assurance Triple Max 2 tyres. Now these tyres are clearly designed for longevity rather than comfort but when you do drive the car you'll hear a lot of tyre noise coming into the cabin. That though I think has more to do with the lack of sound deadening or sound insulation rather than the tyres being noisy. If you choose the cheaper versions you'll get smaller 16 inch alloys with GT tires instead. And by the way, if you're ever worried that the front body kit is going to be a little bit too low, I've gone down fairly steep parking ramps without scraping the front bumper. That's good to know. From the side, you'll see that the S70 has a more traditional three box sedan shape. Here you'll see very distinct parts for the flat bonnet, the body and then the boot in the back. This is as opposed to a slanted or angled front bonnet 
and even a fastback going into a sloping short boot line you'll see in a lot more modern sedan designs. This does give the car a bit more of a dated old school look overall but I think it's the better for it. I mean, for instance, it looks nothing like a Proton Persona or a Proadua Beza from the side and that's definitely a good thing. In a surprise backward step, this car actually has a physical button to activate its keyless entry system. This is as opposed to much more modern touch sensors like in pretty much all other Geely based Protons. Worse still, there is just a single button on the driver's door only instead of having it on both the front doors like in most other cars. This is something that we always complain about in Produa cars but Proton has now done the same thing on this one. At the back, I'll say it again, this is a very handsome, well-proportioned sedan. I much, much prefer this traditional three-box shape over the more organic, rounded shapes we've seen on more modern sedans. One weird thing I've noticed, however, is that this car appears to sit a little bit higher over its rear wheels compared to the front. So from the back, it appears to have a little bit of that tonge look. It has less to do with an awkward shape like in the Proadua Beza, but more to do with how uneven even it is sitting over its tyres. Moving on to the details, the LED lights certainly look very good though perhaps a little bit too dark, a bit too smoked if you pair it with the darker colours like marine blue. The full width LED light strip I'm a big fan of but you will lose out on this if you choose the basic executive version. By now I'm sure you've seen the full light show that this car puts on every time you lock or unlock the car. At the back, the lights dance around which I think looks pretty cool but some people may think it's a little bit over the top. The light show at the front however, I do not like at all. It just looks like the car is glitching out every time it does it. At the back here, you'll also see that the body kit is a little bit overdone, especially at the rear corners in a typical Proton way, I suppose. The bootlit spoiler is also a little bit too big for my liking. As I've said, I much prefer the S70 in its base standard form. Another thing that you will surely notice is the complete lack of any exposed tailpipes on this S70. This is in a stark difference to the X50 with its quad tailpipes which is one more than its number of cylinders. I've always found that to be hilarious. The S70 actually has twin tailpipes but they are hidden well behind the rear bumpers pointing down. Another peculiar thing you will see is that this car has three parking sensors instead of the usual two or four. Just under the center sensor is the rear fog light which I hope I will not see on when it's not needed. One last thing before we move inside, unlike all other Geely based Protons, you cannot open the fuel filler cap from the outside. You have to go full old school and pull a dedicated lever from inside, just like in your dad's Proton Saga. This, I don't like. Moving on inside, the Proton S70 has a super sleek and modern design. This is a bit of a mishmash, almost a greatest hits of the latest Geely based Proton dashboards. The steering wheel is from an X50, while both the screens and the fancy gear lever are taken straight off the flagship X90. But as a whole, this still has its own unique character and it is miles, leagues ahead of its direct competitors, the Toyota Vios and the Honda City. This is both in terms of design and quality. This clearly looks like a much more premium cabin over the very basic city dashboard. But even in terms of design, the top half is all nice soft touch plastics. The center portion is very nicely padded with this Kain Songket pattern as well. This actually feels like a proper C segment cabin, almost up to par with a Toyota Corolla or Honda Civic. Even moving further down where the textures and the plastics get harder and scratchier, the textures and everything are still a step above what you'd find in a city or a Vios. This really feels like a more upmarket product compared to cars of similar price. But not everything is well and good even though its perceived quality overall is very very impressive. In terms of fine details, the fit and finish, not everything will hold up to close inspection. Let's see this part down here for instance, the lines don't necessarily line up and when you do open up the glove box and then close it up gently, the part on the left is not properly closed yet. You have to push it further in, that's not 
very nice. Speaking of quality issues, this particular car has a front seat that rattles and vibrates as you drive along. Would you look at that? And then because the front seat belt buckles are actually quite heavy like this, every time you hit a bump that moves the car laterally from left to right, it will actually bounce on the B pillar. That gets annoying really quickly. And while this is marketed as a C segment product, in certain parts, it feels worse than Proton's own B segment SUV, the X50. For instance, the top of the door cards over here, it's all nice and soft in the X50. Over here, it is all hard plastics. Even the key here is a bit of a downgrade compared to the X50. It's the exact same key, but while in the X50, it is painted silver, over here is just bare black plastic. This, however, is the exact same unit used in the X90 as well. What has been improved, thankfully, are the front seats. The X50, if you remember, had very small, unsupportive front seats. The ones in the S70 are slightly better. The base is still a tiny bit too short and the back could use with a bit more support. But compared to the X50, this is miles better. It's not quite up to the levels of the X70 that is properly excellent, but at least is a nice middle ground now. Another major improvement over the X50 is that the steering wheel is now right dead center in front of the driver. In most of the Geely based Protons, the steering is always slightly offset, which is not an uncommon thing for cars that were designed for left hand drive and then converted to right hand drive. But this S70 is right dead center. It's fantastic. Other than that, this car does offer plenty of cubby holes for you to keep your keys, your phones, your water bottles and so on. You've got a pair of cup holders down here and the second one is actually very deep to hold taller bottles. You've also got a deep center cubby down here, plus plenty of holes up there and a wireless charger for your phone and a smaller pad down here to keep your keys and whatnot. There is an icon in the shape of a car key down there, but no, that is not a place for you to wirelessly charge your key fob. That is the place for you to place your key fob on just in case it runs out of battery. There's also plenty more storage space in the door pockets down here. They've actually moved the speakers further up so you can store large 1.5 litre bottles, no problems at all. Speaking of the audio system, the six speaker setup in the flagship versions sound just about acceptable. I can't imagine how much worse the four speaker setup in the base cars will sound like. By and large, the S70 is very well equipped in here, but the one thing it surprisingly does not have is automatic wipers. That is such a weird omission because how much can that really save? Overall though, I still think the S70 cabin is a nice place to be in. It looks very good, quality is good as well. For the most part, the only thing I can fault it is in the way everything is mostly black and silver. If you look at the Geely versions, you can have the car with white seats. Now, I don't think that will fly very well with Malaysians, but at least having the option of the nice blue dashboard, that would have made it very, very interesting, like the red dashboard in the X50. As it is right now, fully black, it is still nice, but it could have been nicer, I think. Another feature that lifts it well above typical B-segment sedans is the fitment of a sunroof up here. But like I mentioned, it is just a small old-school front sunroof which can open and tilt up. However, you won't find any sunroof controls down here where you would normally find them. To operate the sunroof, you have to swipe down from the center screen over here, pick sunroof control, and then choose open or close from here. If that is too much trouble to you, you can also use voice recognition to open it. Hi Proton, open the sunroof. Good afternoon. Okay, opening. Yeah, it works quite well, but I don't think I would want to speak to the screen for such a simple act of opening the sunroof every single time. Another thing is that the sun shade for the sunroof is actually manually operated, like so, and every time you close it, it just knocks the front part with a bit of a loud noise. I do not quite like that. Just like the sunroof, quite a lot of other major control buttons have been moved into the screen over here. Like in the X50, you used to have a dedicated button for your drive modes. Here, you gotta swipe down from the screen and then choose between comfort, eco, and sport. Having to do that while you drive, I don't think that is especially convenient or safe. 
Another commonly used feature now hidden within the screen is the 360 degree parking camera. But thankfully, it is now much better, much higher res compared to the one in the X50. As for the screen itself, the flagship versions get the exact same white screen that's in the X90 flagship SUV. This runs the exact same Atlas OS. It works very well, everything is nice and snappy. However, it still does not have the all-important Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, at least for now. We have been told by Proton that we will soon get these features as part of an OTA or an over-the-air update, but they will update the X90 first and then lesser models later on. Hopefully, this comes very, very soon because as it is right now, the screen isn't all that useful except for showing your parking cameras. It does have its own onboard navigation function, but exactly as we've seen in previous Proton cars, it's not very reliable or trustworthy. Just putting in the same destination here, comparing it against Google Maps or Waze, this right here is showing it's going to take me 44 minutes to get to KLCC, while Google Maps and Waze are both showing around 35 minutes only. The last time I did the exact same thing two days ago, the difference was over 10 minutes between the two, I would much rather trust Waze or Google Maps. Apple CarPlay and Android Auto cannot come to this car soon enough, I think. One cool thing about the screen is that you can actually customize the miniature version of the car in the display. You can change the color to whatever you want or rather match the car's actual color. And you can even change the number plate as displayed on the model car, like so. That is pretty cool. One thing though, the car model seems to wear the smaller 16-inch alloys instead of the 17s on this particular car. Moving on to the controls down here, you can very easily adjust your temperature or fan settings using these hard buttons down here. At least you're not forced to go through the screens for your air conditioning. That's definitely a good thing. Down here though, is again not very good. This is the exact same gear lever as in the X90, so it has the exact same feature. So every time you want to select drive, you got to push it back twice, or for reverse, push it forward twice. For a three-point turn or even many, many more turns, this gets really annoying very quickly. Now, some of you will point out that this is the exact same system found on a few Volvo products. But even Volvo has learned their lesson. The newer ones no longer need double confirmation like this. Another thing that is exactly the same as in the X90 is the fully digital instrument cluster. This is a full widescreen display which is a step up compared to the X50. That only has a smaller square screen down the middle. This is a full thing from edge to edge. However, just like in the X90, the display is not quite customizable enough and you also lose out on the drive mode specific themes like in the X50. Like in the SUV, every time you select sport, the whole meter will turn red. This one, whatever driving mode you choose, everything just stays the exact same. That's a little bit boring, I think. One last thing, this car does have a full LED interior lighting setup, which is a nice premium touch. And unlike the Toyota Vios, you do get a vanity mirror for the driver. Moving back here though, it's clear to see that rear legroom isn't anywhere near one of the S70's best aspects. As you can see, legroom is just about okay, but this is with the front seat set to my own driving position. I am 167 centimeters tall for your reference, so if you are taller than me, you will set the front seats further back. You'll have less and less legroom back here. This is far, far smaller compared to both the Honda City and the Toyota Vios. But remember, both of those cars are specially made sedans for the ASEAN region with massively huge rear seats. The city, for instance, is said to have D segment legroom for a B segment car. In fact, the Honda City actually has more generous legroom compared to a bigger Honda Civic. Taken in isolation, the S70 has a decent amount of space back here, I think. It should be enough for most Malaysians. But at the same time, people who are already used to the level of space given by the Produa Myvi, Honda City and Toyota Vios will think this back here is absolutely tiny. 
What is better back here compared to the city and the Vios is the headroom over here. You can be much taller than me and still fit in the back just fine. Whereas in the Vios, I've already got my hair touching the headliner. It's not very good at all. Same goes with the seat themselves. The rear bench over here is far more comfortable, far more supportive compared to the ones in the Honda City and the Toyota Vios. You just feel far more comfortable sitting in the back here compared to any of the B segment sedans. This is in terms of softness of the cushion and even the angle of the backrest over here. Other comfort features back here include rear aircon vents, a pair of USB chargers, one type A and one type C, and fully automatic power windows back here. Most Japanese cars don't have this for the rear windows at all. To open the boot, this car does have a smart trunk opening function where you can just walk up to the car with the key in your pocket and within five seconds, the boot will automatically open like so. By right, this is supposed to be useful when you've got your hands full with shopping bags or whatever else. But because this car does not have a power boot function, it only opens up this much. So you always have to end up pushing the tailgate up with your elbow or something. That sort of defeats the purpose, right? As for the boot itself, it is pretty big at an even 500 liters. This is actually slightly smaller than both the Honda City and the Proton Persona, but at the same time, it's also slightly bigger than the Honda Civic and the Toyota Vios. And unlike the Toyota, you can actually fold the rear seats down for extra space. Plus, unlike the Toyota again, here you do get a spare tire under the floor. In this case, a Ling Long space saver. Before we go for a drive, I do want to bring your attention to this. The bolts holding the rear taillights are completely exposed and unpainted, and the torsion bars holding the tailgate is also out in the open. They both look incredibly cheap. So we're finally driving the all-new Proton S70 out on public roads. Let's start with the engine first. This has a 1.5 liter three cylinder petrol turbocharged engine, the exact same one used on the X50 SUV. However, here we're getting the MPI version, the cheaper, less powerful version of the engine as fitted to the lower variants of the X50. Instead of the TGDI direct injection version on the X50 flagship, it doesn't matter which variant of the S70 you choose, whether it's the base executive or the top spec flagship X that we have here, you will get the MPI engine. That is slightly disappointing, but considering the lower prices of the S70 overall compared to the X50 flagship, I suppose that is a downgrade that you will have to accept. But that itself is a massive, massive upgrade over the standard Geely donor car from most other markets. I mean, in markets like China and Russia where the m -Grand is fairly popular, it's actually a very cheap, simple, basic car. Over there, they only get a 1.5 litre naturally aspirated engine paired with a CVT. But here, Proton has transplanted the 1.5 litre turbo engine into this family sedan. So the level of performance that we get here in Malaysia with the Proton S70 is leagues ahead of Geely's base m -Grand. There are of course certain complications or issues with Proton taking the lead in transplanting the engine into the car, but I'll get to that later in a bit. Now, the engine itself makes 150 PS and 226 Newton meters of torque. That is around 30 PS or 30 Newton meters less than the TGDI version in the X50 flagship, but that is still far higher than say the 1.5 liter NA in the base Geely M Grand, as well as its two closest real world competitors, the Toyota Vios and the Honda City. Both of those Japanese rivals use a standard 1.5 liter naturally aspirated engine, and both of them have around 30 to 45 PS less than this one. The difference in terms of performance is massive. 
this is a much much faster car it's not quite up to the levels of a c-segment honda civic turbo kind of performance of course this is about half a step behind but compared like for like this again similarly priced hondas and toyotas this is much much faster this is the fastest car you can buy at this price in terms of absolute performance this car goes from 0 to 100 in about 9.5 seconds while proton claims it goes around 9 seconds i've timed it at about 9.5 which is close enough i suppose now that is about three seconds quicker than both the honda city and the toyota vios there's a massive gap in terms of performance right there but instead of just numbers it's the feel of it that makes this car feel a much more substantial machine just plant your foot down and you are riding a big wave of torque compared to the naturally aspirated 1.5 liter na engines in the toyota and the honda it's not even comparable it's completely different leagues i think that is partly to do with the choice of transmission as well while both the city and the vios run a cvt gearbox and same story with the base geely m grand as well this proton s70 is fitted with a seven speed wet dual clutch transmission it's the same one used in the x50 x70 and x90 suvs just in the name itself a dct versus a cvt that is a big upgrade there so most people in malaysia are not big fans of the name of cvts even though i find them completely acceptable for the most part actually very good for normal city driving but a lot of people don't think they are such a good thing because again most of them have only driven proton cvts which are practically one of the worst in the business especially the early ones but in any case to most people a dct would be seen as an upgrade to a cvt and driving this i would say it's a bit of a yes and no in terms of pure performance it definitely is a good thing to have a dct like this it does give you that very pleasing surge of the engine revs going up and down up and down through the gears that is to be expected of a car of a certain performance whereas in a cvt it will just rise up and then keep to a certain rpm most of the time is just screaming its lungs out which is not a very pleasant thing to hear but you know what the more i drive this s70 especially through slower speeds through city traffic through parking lots and whatnot the more issues i find with this engine and gearbox which is a bit weird because i've lived with an x50 for three years now and i find zero faults with that car even though it shares the same engine and gearbox over here it just feels completely different and it's the worst for it perhaps it has to do with proton having to take the lead in terms of transplanting the engine the gearbox into this base platform so i'll go through the issues one by one number one is in terms of refinement because you definitely feel that this car has a lot of vibrations a lot of noise coming into the cabin you may think this is purely because it's a three pot three cylinder engine but that is not the case the exact same engine in an x50 especially when new was far more refined compared to this one somehow when this s70 sedan you feel so much more of that three cylinder thrum going into the cabin through the steering wheel through the pedals through the seats and especially if you're sitting around in traffic in d you just feel so much more of that vibration that rattle which is really annoying that is nowhere to be felt in the x50 suv perhaps it's to do with the newly designed engine mountings in this car or the gearbox mountings or whatever but the difference is definitely there and the s70 is significant significantly worse compared to the x15 and then we get to the throttle calibration itself now proton claims it has worked hard to adapt this engine and gearbox to fit the characteristics of a sedan part of that is adjusting the torque delivery the torque curve of this engine so instead of giving its full peak torque at 1500 rpm like in the x50 this here in the s70 peak torque comes in at slightly later 1750 rpm now that is supposed to fit the driving style of a sedan more but in reality 
they've just made the whole thing worse the throttle response especially from a standstill especially if you have your auto hold on it's completely off i find it hard to drive this car smoothly at all from a standstill say you're moving off from a complete stop you just tap the throttle pedal gently and the car lurches forward lurch forward is definitely the right word to use to describe the way this car moves from a stop it has a bit of a vibration going on it doesn't feel especially smooth and if you press a little bit more the torque then comes with a boot full of a kick and it can result in an accidental wheel spin which is not the best thing to have it's almost as if you've got a complete novice driving a manual transmission simply dumping the clutch and then the car jumps forward it's not refined at all this is a complete mystery for me because the x50 had a pretty decent throttle pedal calibration this one they've got it completely wrong I just don't understand why really I mean yes this is Proton's first time doing the calibration from the ground up because remember the X50 the X70 the X90 even though they have the same transmission the base versions from Geely had the exact same engine and transmission this is the first time that Proton has to adapt the engine transmission into a chassis from the start I'm hoping they can fine-tune this very very soon because as it is right now yeah that is a massive rate mark on the s70s report card i say now that may sound especially harsh to proton but if you take a drive in the s70 just a simple round block you will know exactly what i'm talking about the way the car moves forward from a standstill the way the throttle pedal the power delivery feels there's just something wrong with it this is only apparent at very low speeds once you've gone past say 10 kilometers per hour everything is fine and dandy but this is malaysia you know we get stuck in traffic all the time kuala lumpur is always jam-packed with stop start traffic so you will feel this issue all the time all right so anyway before all the proton fanboys come at me with pitchforks let's move on to fuel consumption this having driven it around 500 kilometers so far it has average around 8 liters per 100 kilometers which is pretty decent slightly better than what i've experienced in my own x50 now this is measured using the manual way of filling up the car to full tank again and doing a manual calculation of how far i've traveled and how many liters the car has used i've averaged around 8 liters per 100 kilometers or around 12 kilometers per liter now that's going to sound either really good or really bad depending on what you are used to if you're coming off a uh, toyota vios a uh, honda city or a uh, proto myv that's going to sound like a really really high figure but say if you're moving from a bigger car an suv for instance that's not so bad that is already better than what the x50 manages this being a turbocharged engine of course the fuel consumption is going to depend on how you drive the car if you like to put your foot down ride the torque wave and so on you will end up using far more fuel you'll be lucky to get below 10 liters per 100 to be honest if you drive it much more gently like i normally do you'll likely get similar to what i've gotten 8 liters somewhere there turbocharged engines are generally a lot more sensitive to how you drive it like in a regular naturally aspirated car whether you drive it aggressively or not the swing is going to be just about 10 15 percent or perhaps less with a turbocharged engine the harder you drive it your fuel consumption is going to go up exponentially so yeah be warned with that purely in terms of fuel consumption this is far more thirsty compared to say a toyota vios or honda city so i don't suppose there will be a lot of grab drivers driving the s70 for that purpose that's going to be quite costly perhaps going to cut down your profits a fair bit now let's move on to ownership cost or servicing cost now a lot of people seem to think that a turbocharged engine is far more complicated it's going to cost far more compared to a regular naturally aspirated engine 
and on the surface yes this has a lot more parts but if you look at Proton's official service menu service schedule the S70 isn't significantly more expensive to maintain compared to a City or a Vios we've tabled this across five years or 100,000 kilometers and this S70 is only gonna cost around 10 to 20 percent more compared to a City and a Vios I think that is a fair price to pay to enjoy the significant performance advantage with this Proton S70 Turbo. One thing that a lot of people will point out is that this car still runs a timing belt instead of a timing chain like in the Toyota and the Honda. That is very true but according to Proton, this engine only requires a new timing belt change every 6 years or 120,000 kilometers and even when that time comes, the change is going to cost you around 400 ringgit both parts and labor so I don't think that's too much to ask after all. Now let's move on to ride and handling where the S70 absolutely shines as expected since this is a Proton after all. Let's talk about the ride first though because that is the most outstanding part of this S70. It rides like a true blue C segment car and that is despite this car retaining the base platform's rear torsion beam suspension. Now a lot of people have made noise of Proton retaining the torsion beams instead of changing it to a more typical C-segment rear multi-link suspension setup. But once you drive it, yeah, honestly you won't really think that is a downgrade at all. Now a lot of Malaysians, especially those who have grown up driving older Proton models like the Wira, Waja and Preve, they put a lot of attention to the rear suspension systems. All those previous C-segment Proton sedans did use independent multi-link suspension and they all had fairly good handling. This S70 uses regular, cheaper, simpler torsion beam suspension but it's not worse for it really. If you take a drive around town or short highways, this is a fantastically comfortable car. One of the best riding sedans in its segment. If you compare this against B-segment sedans like the Toyota Vios and the Honda City, this is significantly more comfortable than those two smaller sedans. It just rides way more smoothly, way more comfortably than those two basic sedans. This feels way more premium and way more expensive in the way it deals with bumps, whether you're talking about you know slow, sharp bumps like big potholes or speed bumps or even highway drives or highway undulations. This is far superior compared to the Toyota and Honda. Now if we compare this against proper C-segment sedans like the Toyota Corolla and the Honda Civic, the differences get smaller and smaller of course. But I still think this is the most comfortable of the group as well. Perhaps not by much but in terms of absolute comfort, this is the best of the three. However, that is only valid if you're talking about comfort up front. If you're talking about the rear seats however, that typical torsion beam bump and wallow is still slightly there. It's nowhere near as bad as a Honda City or a Toyota Vios of course, but that bounciness is still there. So it's not quite a proper C segment right quality overall. But if you're sitting in front, yeah, it's right up there with the very best. A lot of that have come from Proton engineers fine-tuning the small details of this car's suspension setup. Now speaking to them before the launch, they've said that they've actually made the dampers and the springs slightly stiffer compared to the base Geely model. I mean, this is supposed to handle far more power, far more performance compared to the naturally aspirated base car after all. But even with stiffer springs, stiffer dampers, they've actually managed to make this car more comfortable overall, especially on the very mixed road conditions out here in Malaysia. Now that is Proton's R&D department showing its expertise. So yes, Proton may not own Lotus anymore and that handling by Lotus badge is nowhere to be seen but in terms of fine-tuning the suspension of a car to fit local Malaysian roads, Proton is still the absolute experts in this department. 
Now let's talk about the way this car handles. Now I'm not gonna lie and say that this feels as sporty as a Proton Preve or a Waja before it, but it gets fairly close to it. Now that doesn't really have too much of a thing to do with the rear torsion beams, I think. It's more to do with the electric power steering system of this car. The Preve, even though it's still a fairly modern car, it still had a hydraulic power steering. So that is the thing that gives you a lot of feel through the corners, that gives you the confidence to throw it around corners more so than other C-segment sedans in its time. Here and now, however, the S70 now has an electric power steering, an EPS, and as with most electric power steerings out there, it's almost completely devoid of real steering feel. But that is to be expected, really. In terms of body control, however, it is still damn good. Like I said earlier, it doesn't really have a sporty feel or sporty characteristic overall. But as a car to fling through corners, to string a few corners together up your favorite mountain, perhaps, this is still far better than its competition. It makes the Toyota Vios and the Honda City feel like absolute toys in comparison. This feels far more mature. You'll feel more confident, you'll feel more comfortable, you'll have a lot more fun doing it as well. The one thing that takes away a little bit from the fun factor is the complete lack of pedal shifters on this car, which is a big miss really because this is a DCT gearbox, so having pedal shifters would make it far more fun, far more playful for those who want to have a bit of fun behind the wheel. I mean, you do still have a manual mode, but instead of using pedal shifters like in the modern way, you have to use this small little gear lever instead. And even then, it is completely wonky. Now, a lot of cars offer a manual mode using this gear lever down here, but most of the time, you go up or down to select your gears. In the Proton S70, however, you have to move it left. For downshift, you have to move it right for an upshift. Yeah, that does not feel natural at all. It's so weird. I don't think anyone will be using this regularly, I think. Next, let's talk about refinement. Like I said in the beginning of the driving section, this does feel less refined than the X50, even though it's got the same engine and gearbox. But in terms of engine noise, in terms of vibrations and harshness when you actually drive the car, the difference is not that big. I mean, there you go. This is me giving it the full beans, full throttle. So while you do start to hear the engine revving fairly loudly, it doesn't quite feel as rough as it does at idle or at very low speed coming off from a standstill. When you're on the move, the engine, the gearbox actually feels fairly refined. The engine noise is there but is nowhere near as vocal as either the Honda City and the Toyota Vios. One thing that it has thankfully improved over the X50 is in terms of wind noise. In the X50, as soon as you hit 70, 80 or 100 kilometers per hour, there's a lot of wind noise coming through from the right side, especially from the wing mirror over here. In the S70, thankfully that's all gone. You can go up to 120, even 130, and there's hardly any wind noise from the right side over here. I think in terms of refinement, I would say it's one of the better ones in the class. However, in terms of road noise, it has taken a few backward steps compared to the X50. Out here on Putrajaya, you know the roads are especially rough, and I'm not even sure if you can hear me correctly right now because the road noise is just so loud. You'll have the same experience across more coarse highways like Kersas or North-South Highway or even the LPT. So across longer journeys, the Proton S70 isn't quite the best car to be in. The combination of the high road noise and the less than perfect front seats mean through 200, 300 kilometers, you will feel fairly fatigued, fairly tired in the car. You will want to stop for a quick rest break, I'd say. Compared to its rivals, I would say that the road noise is about on par with the latest Honda City, but the Toyota Vios is definitely quieter on highway runs. 
Now let's talk about the advanced driving assist systems on this S70, it's ADAS features. Now this gets the full level 2 semi-autonomous driving features like in the flagship X90 SUV, which means it is a step up even compared to the X50 SUV. This gives you full autonomous emergency braking, adaptive cruise control, active lane keep assist and so on. And for the most part, it is definitely smoother than on the X50. The way this car takes control of the steering wheel and the throttle pedal are definitely smoother than how it's done in the X50. In terms of hardware, this no longer runs a radar down the front bumper like in the X50. It solely relies on a camera system up here to scan the roads for any obstacles, any other vehicles and whatnot. When you do engage ACC, you will find the center screen over here. It maps out the road in front of you, whether it's going straight or slight curve and whatnot. And you can even tell whether there are other cars, other vehicles, other motorcycles in front of you. That does give you quite a fair bit of confidence that the car does know what's around it. And the car can technically sort of drive itself on the highway. It does have a traffic jam assist system as well and it does work fairly smoothly, even better than the one in the X50. So owners should be using this feature way more than in the X50 SUV, I would say. Plus, Proton has completely eradicated the issue I've experienced in the X50, where whenever it automatically engages the brakes, whether you're on the highway with the ACC on or you're in traffic with the traffic jam assist on, in the X50 you'll hear a loud clunk with the brake pedal. Over here, it's completely silent. However, there is still a small issue with the auto brake hold. Let's say you've come to a complete stop. Whether you're stopping at a traffic light or in traffic, the auto hold system down here will hold the car on the brakes without you having to place your foot on the brake pedal. The thing is, if you do press on the brakes again in this state, you'll hear this. Yeah, that does not fill you with confidence at all. That's just weird. One last thing I want to show you has to do with the auto hold system again in combination with the sloppy throttle calibration. So you come at a slight incline, it doesn't even have to be especially steep hill. You just come to a complete stop, let the car rest on the auto hold system and then you just feed a very gentle throttle input as you want to move along. But yeah. Somehow the car will do that instead. It'll just give you a boot full of torque, give you a bit of a wheel spin, makes you look like a complete idiot out on the road. That is definitely not a good thing. So there you go guys, that's my full review of the all new Proton S70 sedan. As you can clearly tell, this is a car with a long list of faults and flaws. But hopefully some of them such as the lack of Apple CarPlay and Android Auto and even the terribly calibrated throttle pedal can be rectified very very soon. If you're willing to wait until those issues are solved or even have enough faith in Proton to just buy it out right now, I think the S70 is a top-notch excellent sedan for its price. For the same money as either Honda City or a Toyota Vios, you do get a much much better car overall. It is much quicker, the quality of the interior is much better and the ride and handling is in different leagues altogether. Of course, it's not quite up to the levels of a proper C-segment sedan, but it doesn't have to be because this is priced at 90000 not 140. So the only question now is, is whether you are willing to take the downgrade from going from either Honda or Toyota to a Proton as you see here right now. And even if you're okay with that, would you still go for the S70 sedan or the X50 SUV? Me personally, I still think I would choose the X50 over this one for its better looks and better overall image. What about you? Let me know in the comment section below. Thank you for watching everyone and stay safe.